Okay, so the first conference was organized by Majid Hassan Isada in 2006 in Utrecht, in the Netherlands. The second and third conferences were then organized here in Prague in 2008 and in Tokyo in Japan. The second was organized by Radka here and the third one by, by Novo Torida over there. And so since there were already, since already five years passed since then, we were quite eager to organize this, this conference again. But I have to admit that we were quite nervous whether we will attract enough participants for the conference, especially this year when there's a lot of budget cuts in the funding agencies and governments, etc. And we were really getting nervous as the deadline for submissions was, was uh, getting closer because two days before the deadline we had only three registered people in the course and five abstracts, but then it suddenly started flooding in. And so, so at the end we ended up actually with 30 people in the course. We had to close the course because there was too much interest in that. And we have 60, 60 uh, presentation here, so sort of like the six, 60 participants. And we, we are very happy because we see a lot of our friends here, close friends, colleagues, but we also have people from all continents of this planet, from Far East in Asia to, to Australia, over there, Africa, both Americas, right? as well as Europe and Middle East. So we are welcome, welcome all here, and thank you for coming. Uh, I would like to thank the conveners, if this works, uh, this conference for preparing this program for you and you can see that it lists all the major hydrous developers as well as developers at various uh, specialized modules and then I would like to thank mainly the local organizing committee mainly Radka here and her students because they are doing a magnificent job already organizing the short course which ended up yesterday and a lot of you experienced that and I, I'm sure they will do good job now during this week as well. Well, this is the program of the conference. So we will start the first session with the first keynote uh, lecture, which will be given by Lee Fankenuten, who is here, who is the godfather of the Hardest program. Uh, and you could argue of the soul physics discipline you know, overall. Uh, I'm sure he doesn't need really a further introduction because you all know him personally or from the literature. Then in the afternoon we have the session on inverse problem and Radka Kodesheva will have her keynote presentation. Then tomorrow we will focus on biogeochemical transport reaction with a specialized module at Atlant and HP 1, 2 and 3. And we will have keynote presentation by Ginter and Diedrich who are the main developers of these specialized modules. And finally, in the afternoon, we will have uh, some uh, modeling application to, to irrigation. So although we, we are not running any simultaneous sessions, we would still like to keep the program as it is, so stick with, with the timeline. That's my, my last note here. And uh, so the keynote present, presenters should stick to 20, 25 minutes and the others to 15 minutes. And this slide shows you how you should prepare your presentation. <laughs> so you should introduce yourself, <laughs> uh, give an outline, motivation, results, and then if you stick to this plan, we guarantee you a warm applause at the end. <laughs> uh, this is how it usually turns out, at least for me. <laughs> Previous speakers keep on mumbling and taking my precious time, so that's how we use <laughs> Then I forgot to introduce myself, spend a lot of time on motivation. <laughs> and then I get usually the, get interrupted by the self-aggrandizing question by the annoying audience <coughs> that I like this question. So anyone, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> and then three minutes before my time is out, well, the, I realize I have 30 slides which I have to run through. <laughs> Okay, but anyway, keep in time, keep in mind that we have 15 minutes, and uh, at the end of your presentation, we will grab you or use any type of violence to get you off the floor. <laughs> so, read <really>, with that. <laughs> Very good.
So the tour is my number. Well, thanks so much. I start because we're already running the meet schedule. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank first of all uh, Radka and Mirek for, for organizing this. It's been an absolute pleasure being here. Uh, the early part of the week also is the short course. It's also great to see a lot of people that I haven't seen for a while. So it's uh, it's uh, it will be a very interesting uh, two more days. Um, Jurka uh, made up this title, so I'm not responsible for the title. <laughs> but I will, you know, he wanted me to talk a little bit about, about you know, some general aspects of modeling. What I want to, what I want to do. Okay. Is this not, uh, this ah. Oh, okay. Maybe. That goes. Ah, maybe they can put out the Yeah, okay. So what I want to do is actually talk a little bit up about the number of topics that we are uh, working on. Uh, several of these are in Brazil. I'm in, uh, located in Brazil these days. So talk a little bit about fetal remediation, some of the issues that we have with, with Foster Gibson. Uh, and also a, uh, an example, just very briefly, about a polluting uh, uranium mining site that we have in Brazil. But I want to put this in a broader uh, framework, talk a little bit about the irrigation and a couple of uh, examples, and I want to put it in the broader uh, framework of environmental issues. And of course, you know, York already gave you the, the, the welcome, and it's really impressive, actually. This is a word that, uh, that York and the people in Australia invented, hydrazine, so working with hydrazine and applying it. Uh, it's great to see so many applications, and that's really uh, Probably the only philosophical aspect I want to say is that yeah, hydrates have become an amazing tool. Uh, I never knew that this uh, would, would materialize in this way uh, 20, 30, 35 years ago when we all started this. So it's being used by quite a few people. And I hear from, uh, from Mirac that uh, what are it, about 10,000 downloads of hydrates one day a year. So it's really uh, taken off and a lot, a lot of people are using it. So the more general framework of the talk is really about, uh, about environmental issues. Of course, what we're focusing on is a slice of the subsurface, uh, the unsaturated zone, people call it sometimes the critical zone, or the Vedo zone, the connection with the surface, and of course groundwater. Uh, and we're making our uh, habitat very much the function of the local hydrology of, of the areas. You know. So people are increasingly going to, uh, to alternative irrigation methods, subsurface drip, and surface drip is, uh, of course, very, very popular now, and certainly in the Central Valley, but you can see it's being implemented in many, many parts of the world, also in, in, in Africa and many arid regions. This was an experiment we did in the Central Valley, but people, you know, the uh, farmers and, and extension specialists are very interested in, in how the uh, moisture front moves as a function of soil texture. Uh, these are some experiments that they did, and then we used, of course, hydrus, where we can actually predict that very well. So hydrus is really a, a, a very nice tool. Uh, it's 1D, 2D, uh, 3D, uh, to uh, give some guidance on a variety of things, whether it's in agriculture and also in, 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 in terms of pollution uh, problems. This is one example of the application for subsurface drip. Uh, there's another one I want to show you. This is completely different, but yet very, very much similar. Uh, this is a picture, some of you may have seen this, uh, of people. This is actually in Sindh province in, in Pakistan with these large pitchers. And these pitchers, people like get water. These pitchers have a certain permeability, and the water very slowly uh, moves out, it evaporates, so these things are sometimes used actually for, uh, for uh, as, air, as a modern air conditioner. So, uh, but they can also be used for, uh, for irrigation. And so people can put these pitches in the soil, put in water, and the issues really are not very much different than uh, subsurface uh, irrigation. Because the, 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 uh, the, 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 uh, the outside of the, of the pitches are, are uh, a little bit 
porous, and so you have a, a it generates a flow field into the soil that is unsaturated. And so the advantage is to keep it unsaturated will really means that you uh, cut down on uh, on uh, preferential flow, and so you have a much more uh, better control of the system. Here are some simulations also with 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 Hydrus uh, 2D. Here is actually an axisymmetric uh, simulation. Here the picture and then some, uh, some uh, moisture movement around it. And of course the bottom line for certainly managers and extension people is, is how these uh, moisture fronts develop uh, around the pitches. Uh, so when you have a, a sandy soil, you have a lot of downward movement. When you have a more fine textured soil, you get a much more spherical development. And the same issues uh, are, are with, uh, with subsurface, subsurface drip. One of the issues that they had at that time was, should we use a small pitcher or a large pitcher? Uh, the small pitchers are much cheaper, but you have to fill them in with water a little bit more. Uh, but the, uh, the developments are really not that much different. Of course, one concern with pitcher irrigation is it's, it's really not uh, very adaptable to large-scale uh, farming. It's very nice for, uh, for uh, vegetables and so on. Uh, Another, another uh, uh, system with irrigation that people are now uh, <coughs> experimenting with is, is some people call this a subsurface water retention technology, SWRT, a fellow called Elvin Smucker in the States is working on that. I know a couple of people in, uh, in Brazil are also looking at that, where they have these engineered kind of uh, low permeability membranes or zero permeability they put into the subsurface and it works actually quite well that these, these things uh, keep, uh, keep water from moving uh, down if you have a, a relatively coarse textured soil. If you have fine textured soils, the capillarity uh, keeps the water from, from, uh, from going into these uh, protected areas. And so apparently this is improving the irrigation frequency <coughs> quite significantly. And this is actually an experiment that Elvin and his group did with, uh, with corn. So it's, it's not just a small plot, they can really implement this at a larger scale with the uh, contours, the uh, permeable, impermeable membranes, and then uh, uh, without. And you can see with the same amount of, uh, of uh, rain fed uh, uh, water, uh, you get a much better crop using this uh, contour uh, thing. Of course, the, and so we're doing a uh, uh, Alfred Smirkler, Andre Cooper, <coughs> some of you may know, is, is doing some, some simulations. But it's very much the question how to put these things in there. Should that be a V shape? Should that be some kind of a semicircular thing? How deep? How wide? What the spacing and so on. So there are a number of issues that are very nicely uh, researched using uh, Hydrus, Hydrus 2D, Hydrus even 3D. So it doesn't have to be uh, uh, in 2D necessarily. So you see, these are some of the issues that, that, that where these codes that we have uh, can be used. Much of these simulations, if you look at the uh, modern parts, are based on the Richards equation. And of course, the critical component, if we look at the irrigation methods and sustainable agriculture, is the uh, uh, sink curve, which is really for water uptake uh, uh, as a function of water stress, but also in the building salinity, stress, and so on. And the, the classical approach, basically, and that's what we use in Hydrus most often, is the uh, FEDIS approach, where you say that uptake is proportional to potential transpiration. You have some kind of a uh, stress function and the distribution of the roots, and this is then the FEDIS function. There are a number of things that now are very interesting, where people uh, start uh, uh, playing with this source term, both theoretically and experimentally, to get the most out of your water. You know, and one of the things that, that we're looking at, and certainly also the lab, but uh, in many places, deficit of irrigation, that we, we can actually re reduce the, the uh, uh, use of water by applying a little bit of stress to the plants. And, 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 and plants are like people, they're very smart and they know how to find the water. And so the issue is not necessarily maximizing uh, yield with optimizing to get the most per unit uh, area of water, per unit amount of water. Uh, another thing would be is compensated uptake of water that plants know how to 
uh, search for water in parts of the root zone that are have, have a little bit more water and then they kind of ignore the, 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 the drier part. And similarly, uh, active and passive uptake, including compensated uptake of nutrients. And this was kind of a little bit of a motivation of us to look at uh, uh, one of the areas where, where this is not just, just, just nutrients, but you can also look at, at metals. And so one of the things that we looked at was, was compensated uptake of, uh, of water and, and, and uh, contaminants. The idea of compensated uptake is, is you know, when you plot a parameter by itself versus itself, you got also a straight line. So this is actually relative transpiration, TA over potential, actual transpiration over potential transpiration. Of course, when you plot that by yourself, this omega, you get a straight line, it's at 45 degrees. The idea of compensated uptake is to move this curve a little bit to the left with some kind of a parameter here, we could call the water stress index, and then everything that's being uh, stressed we actually force the uptake to be a little bit higher. Not higher than the maximum, this is that alpha to some extent that, that goes still from zero to one. Uh, but we force a little bit more uptake uh, in the stress area. And you can extend this also actually to, to nutrient uptake. And in the next example I talk about feta remediation. It doesn't necessarily be nutrients but also uh, heavy metals. You do relatively the same. There's an interesting paper I thought uh, Jurke, that you wrote with, uh, with Jan Hopmans in ecological modeling, where this is all uh, explained in great detail. Anyway, we used this uh, for a project we had in, uh, in Brazil, where we looked at the uptake of heavy metals uh, by uh, vetiver grass, which is uh, known to be a hyper-accumulator of, of metals. And uh, the, the, the Embrapa there, which is kind of the agricultural research service of Brazil, did a lot of experiments looking at uh, uh, uptake of these metals and as a way of, of uh, remediating uh, polluted soils. And we try to, uh, to simulate that uh, just the conventional way with passive uptake, linear sorption. Uh, we did some experiments on, on the sorption. We also uh, used some uh, literature values and you know the, the experimental data and the simulations didn't come out very well. So we had to go to this active uptake uh, uh, to get a, a reasonable description. Not that we necessarily believe all the parameters that we obtained, but at least we got some description of the data uh, that provides some guidance about perhaps how long uh, we have to grow these crops or these, this, this, this particular grass uh, to remediate. So there's a, a paper about this in the, in the proceedings, so I'm not going to go present a lot of detail about it. Another, another issue where we work with in Brazil has to do with fossil gypsum and, and fertilizers. I, those that, that were here earlier this week, uh, Jörg gave a, a, an example, showed uh, some of the work that Dietrich Jacques did in, uh, in Belgium with fertilizers. Fertilizers have a tendency when they are produced uh, to accumulate uranium. Um, and, uh, and fossil gypsum, uh, 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 radium tends to, uh, I'll have a, a slide about that, tends to accumulate. One of the issues in Brazil is that many of the rocks that are used for, for producing metals uh, are relatively high in radioactive materials. We call them N naturally occurring radioactive materials. And this is <coughs> the combining site for uh, fertilizers. The processes really have an appetite, basically that is being treated with sulfuric acid and it gives you the phosphoric acid that's being used for the fertilizers, you know, and TSP, whatever, all these, these, these fertilizer compounds. But it also produces, I call it the byproduct, phosphogypsum, where for every ton of fertilizers, you produce about four, four tons of, of phosphogypsum. And then when you look at the, the scheme is that, that um, the, the uh, production process is that a lot of the uranium tends to accumulate into the uh, phosphor into the uh, fertilizers, so in this case it's a TSP, a triple uh, superphosphate, while radium tends to accumulate more in the phosphogypsum. And so it was considered to be really a waste product for a long time, actually. When you go to Brazil, you can find a lot of these enormous uh, piles of phosphogypsum. The same is true in many other countries. You go to Florida, 
uh, enormous piles. And in Florida and the States, it's classified as a, as a waste product, so it cannot be used. In Brazil, now they start looking at this as a possible m means of, uh, of uh, applying it to agricultural soils, because it's really essentially calcium sulfate with uh, some uh, with some uh, radium and, uh, and also some heavy metals in there. But the, the concentrations are, are pretty low. At the same time there, you know, especially, this is Brazil here, we're located in Rio de Janeiro, somewhere at the bottom here. Uh, a very dry area here, you have Amazonia. The Cerrado that here is, is a very fertile, not necessarily fertile, but very well used for uh, uh, soybeans, for sugarcane, uh, more in the south, uh, and various uh, agricultural operations. And the problem is these soils, they're, they're highly weathered, of course, very red, yellow soils, so they're high in area and aluminum oxide, they're slightly acidic and so on, and they're relatively, they're relatively poor in nutrients, especially phosphate calcium, and so the use of phosphate gypsum as both a fer fertilizer and an amendment uh, is helping the system very well. So these things are now uh, being used more often. Uh, we did some uh, simulations uh, where we <coughs> applied the phosphate gypsum. This is actually some, 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 some uh, curves where we try to, uh, to get uh, the average recharge rate of the, a typical uh, Cerrado soil. So we did that for 25 years. Here you see precipitation potential ET, and then we calculate drainage. And actually what, what we did, we ended up using a steady state flow approach where we estimated the uh, long-term drainage rate from uh, the cumulative bottom rate. It's a very good approximation. We could go to steady state uh, simulations. So, so the issue then would be if we to apply phosphogypsum for many, many years, in this case 27 years, uh, the radium, radium activity is given here. Uh, it's it's not, not overly large, but there's still a concern whether or not that po would pose some environmental issues. So we assume that the phosphogypsum was applied a typical dose uh, for 27 years and then we looked at how uh, long this would be uh, moving uh, for another 170 whatever years uh, over a total of 200 years. Yeah. Now here are some, uh, some, some results we got. Uh, uh, this is the transient simulations and so then we went to the steady state simulation for the water flow where we just assumed that this was the gypsum was a in, in the irrigation water and the rainwater over, over the entire year, it gives essentially the same results. Uh, yeah. And then here is also uh, the, the, the final results of the simulation we used partly HP1 for this. Uh, Dirk was involved uh, uh, in, in many ways. Uh, but you can see here that the movement, it's not moving very well. Uranium, of course, has a very high. Uh, uh, radium has a very high uh, absorption potential, so there's a lot of interactions with the soil, <coughs> and the concentrations are really not uh, a major concern at all. This is done assuming equilibrium transport. And so if we have non-equilibrium transport, uh, the concern of course would be that it would be moving much faster. There are a lot of non-equilibrium transport processes, physical equilibrium, non-equilibrium, uh, chemical non-equilibrium, call it facilitated transport. Uh, to some extent this is a concern, at the same time if you have uh, non-equilibrium transport, we know that the maximum concentrations actually will go down. There will be more rapid transport into the surface, but the, 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 the real concern will be the maximum concentration, so those will be actually going down further. And so again, uh, environmental, there would be not a whole lot of concern about this. I have one more example, uh, uh, Jurka, uh, where we actually started looking more at the non equilibrium transport. This is that uh, I mentioned, uh, we did some work with a, uh, a polluting uranium mining site. It's a site, uh, I try to always hide it, but it is actually located in Brazil. Uh, this is the complex of the uranium mine, uh, of the, the processing, sorry, this is the, 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 the milling area here is the heat bleaching, and then uh, that is the, so you have the, the, the basically the host material uh, grinded and it's leaching into these uh, holding ponds. There are quite a few, but these were the, the, the central ones because these have a uh, very high uh, uranium content. So. 
about uh, the concentration is about uh, 80,000 becquerel per liter. Very nasty material, pH about uh, 1 to 1.5. And this is then used and it goes to the uh, main plant where they produce then the, the yellow cake. And what they noticed at one point in time, this was in the year 2000, that the uh, water levels, whatever the, whatever the levels of that, that liquid were, was going down, initially they thought it was just <coughs> natural evaporation, and then they really realized that they had uh, some problems, and they had uh, impermeable membranes at the bottom, and clearly there were some, uh, uh, some rips in that. And so we did a lot of simulations. First of all, they put in uh, quite a few monitoring wells. Actually, there's one well here, PMA 12, where they noticed there was a lot of pollution. PMA 12. Uh, this is a, a surfer plot of the uh, uranium <coughs> area. So what we decided to do was well, let's take a, a cross section here and see how the how the material moves down. This is a, a cross section of the simulated area. So here you have uh, one of these tanks that presumably leaked. Uh, they, of course, the rips are very small, but uh, we did some uh, uh, more local simulations and found that the effective area of infiltration of the larger scale would be about uh, 5 to, to 7 meters wide. So that's what we did, and we just uh, assumed a steady infiltration rate that we calculated from the, from the local refined uh, calculations. And then we followed it, so that we surface soil, the subsurface soil, I call it here, this is more kind of a granular aquifer. The water table is roughly at the edge of between the two uh, media, and then here we have a, a fissure or a fractured rock type uh, system. Uh, on the area, about 324 meters. So we used hydros through the event actually quite well. We had three observation points. We put it at this well here to see what the concentrations would be. Uh, the concentration of that well were also pretty pretty bad actually, still about 3,000 becquerel per liter pH, uh, not 1.5 anymore, but certainly also not the background uh, pH of about uh, six and a half or so. Mm. These are some uh, simulations for S, S uh, sulfate. In the, so you see here the well, and it moves actually quite fast. Some of the material move in, into the uh, 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 fissured aquifer or fractured rock, <coughs> uh, and then and, and then down. For the uranium, with the KD that we had, we had some measurements both with uh, 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 just under the under the, the, the tank here. We call this the, these ponds, and then a little bit down, we had some uh, some uh, batch experiments in the laboratory. We used the background. Uh, <coughs> Uh, liquid of the, the thing, so the KD is very much a function of uh, the ionic composition of the system. And if we still we use a, a linear isotherm uh, given uh, uh, the effect of the background concentration, so we had slightly different values uh, below the tank as well as in the aquifer. But the uranium didn't move at all, very little. And actually, when we started making the uh, simulations with the equilibrium approach, KD about 5. Uh, this is what came out. It predicted that, uh, that the maximum would be at about uh, 175. I should mention that uh, once they uh, noticed that pollution, they, they pumped out the, uh, the material and uh, put a new uh, uh, permeable membrane at the bottom. So, so uh, there was a pollution of about one year, and then it, it stopped. So you can see it went down here to a concentration of about 50 <coughs> becquerels per liter. While in reality, the, the plume or the, 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 the maximum concentration was observed after uh, five years. So it's clear there's a lot of faster movement going on, uh, preferential flow probably. And these are the three nodes. The upper one is very close to the uh, phreatic surface, and basically the capillary frame is <coughs> deeper. And this is towards the uh, uh, fractured aquifer at the bottom. So clearly a lot of preferential flow was going on, and there are many ways of, uh, of accounting for that. One would be to use you know, immobile water here, theta m over theta, uh, but that has only a very little effect if you have a lot of absorption. And so this, this absorption was very important. So what we played with mostly was this f factor that says that the amount of absorption size that's in equilibrium with the mobile region <coughs> would be very small. And this is the one that we fiddled with. Uh, 
we basically uh, uh, estimated that from uh, from the uh, breakthrough curve of that well. And what we needed was actually a beta value. When this F is from seven, this is a relatively small effect because this term is very large. And so we, the beta and F values were about 0.2. So the material was moving at a rate of about five times faster. First order mass transfer coefficient, very consistent with literature data. <coughs> so at least we could get it uh, roughly where the uh, measurements were made. One other last thing, and I know we're getting close to the end here, but one other thing is, is when we make the uh, uh, simulations, uh, because, because we had the leaking, this is the unsaturated zone, and here basically is the capillary frame, so it went down and then on gradient. Uh, one of the things we noticed is, is, is the simulations is that a lot of the material stayed below the, uh, below the ponds. Uh, and there's really no, 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 no driving force to, to go down because this was uh, remediated or was, was, was fixed, a new, a new permeable, impermeable membrane was put into, into place. So there's really no driving uh, force uh, for the material to go further down. And it does suggest actually that, that one thing that they could have done is actually dig up, they dig, they, they dig only about uh, 50 centimeters or so, they could have digged actually the whole subsurface a little bit to the ground or the table and basically I would have remediated the whole thing. So here again also the, these hydroscopes, these type of simulations can give a lot of guidance in terms of engineering. When we had preferential flow, there is a little bit more going down, of course, but, but still we had a lot of material staying there that could have been uh, taken out. Now they're going to wait until the end of their uh, existence. They think that they will be mining another, uh, whatever, 20 years or so, and then they have a certain period where they really wait, and then they can dig it up. So that's basically what I want to talk about. Uh, again, uh, it's really neat to see people using these codes all over the world. The people here are coming, as Jörg has said, from, from, from any, any, any part, any uh, continent. Uh, it's, it's very satisfying, again, also for me that we started this 25, 30 years ago. We had no idea that this would develop in such a big effort. I want to thank my collaborators in that sense, also certainly Mirak Kassayna, I don't know if he's here, uh, but they did a great job in putting this uh, graphical interface in there. In terms of this talk, I want to uh, thank all the people that did the work. I'm only talking about it. They did all the work. Francesco was a master student. He did the feed remediation thing. Betty May, my wife, and uh, a number of the students, Marcia Battaglia, Camilla Bezerra, Camilla Bragi, who is also here. Uh, they did a lot of uh, material with the uh, uranium mine. Uh, Renato Cotta, Diederik Jacques also worked out uh, with us. Uh, Sijan, uh, he's a professor in nuclear engineering. Who, uh, who oversaw these, some of these projects. And then also Marcia and Camilla did the fossil bricks and uh, materials. So thanks again. Have a lot of fun the next few days, and uh, it's really nice. And so we'll get to talk. And this is really something else I want to say at the end is, is take advantage of this. Talk with your neighbors, talk with the people, you know, exchange information. Uh, uh, about your experience with the codes and help each other. We're, we're all in this together. Okay, thanks so much. Obviously, cannot fall with action my threatening remarks. <laughs> the take home message, right, is that you can use pictures for other substances than beer, at least for checks and chemicals here. <laughs> okay.